Good morning, Boise New Hope family. I hope this message finds you all well. hope you all had a great day and a great week. We're going to pick up our conversation in the book of Isaiah today. We are in chapter 50, and we'll do chapter 51 as well this morning. Uh, last week, we kind of ended with the idea that God will contend or God will fight for our relationship with him. And there's nothing that we can do that will discourage God's love for us. There's things that we will do that will impact that relationship, but his love will not be turned away from us. Um, and so God's love is a constant in our lives. And this week we want to explore a little more about God's contending for us in chapter 50. And we'll also talk more about God's heart for his people in chapter 51. So to get us started, let's go ahead and read all of chapter 50, uh, all 11 verses there, just to kind of help us uh, start out here well. It says this, it says, This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Is my arm too short to ransom you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? By a mere rebuke, I dragged the sea. I turned rivers into a desert. The fish rot for lack of water, and I have thirst. I clothe the sky with darkness and make sackcloth its coverings. The Lord, the Sovereign Lord, has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me, by mo he wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like the one being taught. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears that I have not been rebellious and I have not drawn back. I offer my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. Then I hide my face from the mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. There I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is it he that will condemn me? They all wear out like a garment. The moss will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him walk in the dark, who has no light. Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. I'm sorry, let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now, all you who light fires and, provoke, and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go and walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. And so in the first few verses of chapter 50, um, we see that God is questioning the doubts of the people. Remember that they feel cut off. And this is in the middle of that Babylonian captivity. So they have been cut off from God for 70 years. And wondering where God is and wondering why he is, and if he's, why and if he has forgotten his people. Um, but God has not divorced his people, has not cut them off from his presence. Remember, this captivity was a punishment for their sins, but that time is over. And so God is continuing to remind Israel just how powerful he is in verses 2 and 3. And so God is so mighty that nothing will stop him when he has his heart set upon his people. And this is the same Lord who has created the heavens and the earth, who sustains everything and has dominion over everything. It is not too hard of a thing for God to extend his hand to his people. And he just wants to remind them of the fact that he is still the Lord. He is still God. And they are still his chosen people. So in spite of this separation that's become of them, it's not a permanent separation. In spite of this distance between God and his people, God is bridging that gap so they can then be restored in their relationship to him. Verses 4 through 11 reflect on that feeling of God comforting his people. Uh, if the people listen to the Lord, and they must obey his voice. And they seek to do his will, and God will help him to do all those things. Remember, these people are abused and mistreated in verse 6, but God promises to help them. We're told that the Lord is near, and that the Lord is near to us, and will not be put to shame. So those that seek to abuse or to harm God's people, they can keep their head held high because God is still with them. I think it's important to point out that people have a full confidence in God's deliverance for them. Their eyes are so fixed upon the Lord that they're not going to be shaken. You see, we live in a world where if someone disagrees with us, we immediately put them to shame through social media or some other avenue. Um, 
that makes it an unpopular bear that opinion. Uh, but I think the people of the self, these people got to ruin to bear up that abuse because they were confident in the things of God. But we sometimes share to the gospel for fear of ridicule or rejection by somebody. These are people whose very lives and bodies were beaten because of their belief. And we don't want to do it because we might be embarrassed. It's just a convicting thought that um, the people of God, having a full confidence God, can walk through that abuse with the head held high. And we should be able to do the same in our generation as well. We should trust God with the results and not be concerned about what happens to us. God will care for us. And if the world doesn't like me, that probably means I'm doing something right. So God will care for us. God will still take care of his people. So even when we are shamed or embarrassed or rejected or despised by this world, God has not forgotten his people. And that's just an important reminder for us to remember as we look at chapter 50 here, that God has not forgotten his people. And because of their confidence in God's deliverance, they can walk through that abuse with their head held high, full of confidence in God and who he is. So jumping into chapter 51, let's go and read verses 1 through 8 to start that off, shall we? It says this, it says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteous and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut, to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was but one, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wasteland like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, and skidding in the sound of singing. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. The law will go out for me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way, and I will bring, I'm sorry, and my arm will bring justice to the nations. The islands will look to me and wait in hope for my arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look up at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. Hear me, you who do what is right, or you who know what is right, you people who have my law in your heart. Do not fear the reproach of men, or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment. They are worn out, and I'm sorry, the worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, my salvation through all generations." So God is reminding Israel of their calling a few chapters ago. Remember, he called them by name. and He renamed Jacob to Jerusalem. And so now he's again asking Israel to recall their roots. Remember, they're, they're the seed of Abraham. And Abraham is the seed of their father. And he made an everlasting covenant with Abraham. And so when the people remember their roots, they remember that inheritance that was promised to them, they can rejoice because the Lord has been faithful to them. He has not forgotten that promise. So now that God is calling the people to listen to him, saying, look, if you are, in fact, the seed of Abraham, you do remember the covenant I made with him, listen to my commands. God's desire is for his righteousness to become the righteousness of the people. And it makes a point to remind the nation that God's salvation is near. So that a couple times, in verse 7 and 8, that God's salvation is near. Verse 6 and 8, that God's salvation is near. And he's going to judge all the people according to his righteous standard. And I think what's important to understand here is that God's standard doesn't change. God's standard of righteousness doesn't go up or down depending upon the popular opinion of the world. Um, and so in verse 7, he reminds his people that living a righteous life will incur the reproach from the world. So in other words, living by God's standards, the world's not going to accept that standard. They don't understand that standard we live by. But God is telling the people that it's not the world's standard that matters, but his his righteousness, his salvation will last for all generations. And that time has not been fulfilled yet. All generations means all generations. There's still more to come. So God's salvation, his promised righteousness for his people, has not ended yet. So just because they might be returning to Jerusalem from Babylon, just because they have that um, freedom from that oppressors, doesn't mean that their lives are easy again, because that's what got them in trouble in the first place. They forgot to keep their eyes fixed on the Lord. So God's trying to remind the people that my righteousness should be your righteousness. And that's what his desire is for us, to live a life worthy of that righteous calling we have received. Reading a little more, verses 9 to 13 says this, it says, Awake, awake, clothe yourself with strength, the arm of God. Awake, 
as in days gone by, as in generations of old. Was it, was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the roads and the depths of the sea so the redeemed might cross over? The ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Ah, even I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you fear mortal men, the sons of men, you who are but grass? You might forget the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You might be live in constant terror day to day because of the wrath of the oppressor, who is bent on destruction. For where is the wrath of the oppressor? So let's pause there for a second in verse 13. God's trying to call his people to wake up. Um, basically, the work of God is done. And the fact that God sustained his people is calling them to be alert and awake for their future. He's trying to remind them that the Lord who saved them in the past will do so again in the future. He's, he's basically shouting to the people, don't forget me. Don't forget the things I've done. I am more powerful than any oppressor you might have or any nation that might try to oppress the people. Remember me. Remember the Lord. That's what he's trying to um, impress upon his people as they come out of Babylon, that this nation that oppressed them, look, there's nothing compared to who I am. Don't, don't get caught up in that oppression. Remember, I am the Lord your God who will save you. And as we've talked before uh, last week and in previous weeks, that sometimes our circumstances are bleak, but if we only see God through those circumstances, through those eyes, uh, it can appear that he's not doing anything on our behalf. But nothing could be further from the truth. Just as he told the people his salvation will be for all generations, um, he's also telling them that when they come out of captivity, the only person they need to hold on to is God. Don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at the oppression. Just hold on to me. As I talked about with the people walking through uh, that opposition with their head held high, so now they need to do the same thing as they leave that opposition behind to keep their eyes focused on the Lord. And so God's trying to give them that admonition that look, look to me, look to the Lord. I will save you because my salvation is for all generations, for all peoples. Reading the rest of this chapter, verses 14 to 23, it says this, it says the cowering prisoners, the cowering prisoners will soon be set free. They will not die in their dungeon, nor will they lack bread. For I am the Lord your God, who turns up the sea so that it waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. I put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. I have set the heavens in place, who laid the foundations of the earth. I have said to the Zion, you are my people. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the hand of God and the cup of his wrath. You have drained it to the dregs, the goblet that makes men stagger. Of all the sons she bore, there's none to guide her. Of all the sons she reared, there's none to take her by the hand. These double calamities have come upon you. Who can comfort you? Ruin and destruction, famine and sword, who can console you? My sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street. And yet, like antelope caught in the net, they are filled with the wrath of the Lord and the rebuke of your God. Therefore, hear this, you afflict the ones, made drunk but not with wine. This is what the sovereign Lord says, your God, who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that makes you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. I will put you into the hands of your tormentors who said to you, Fall prostrate, may walk over you, and made your back at the ground like a street to be walked over you. Uh, you know, as we finish this out, this chapter, we see God's cup of wrath passing from the people. You know, if you've ever had a cup of coffee and at the bottom you have uh, the dregs, those coffee grounds at the bottom, you get that final drink and it's kind of gritty and unpleasant. You're not expecting to have to chew your coffee that morning. Um, it's an unpleasant sensation. It's not comfortable. The Lord's telling his people that this will no longer be their, no longer be their reality. They don't have to drink from the bitterness of God's wrath. That, that will be taken from them. You know, it took 70 years for the Lord's anger to pass away. It took 70 years for the people's heart to come back to the Lord, to remember him and all they do. But his anger served a purpose, and his judgment served its purpose to restore the relationship between God and his people. And so as we look at the book of Isaiah, if we learn nothing else from this book, remember this, that God's judgment, God's anger is not forever. His salvation lasts forever. His wrath is not forever. His judgment is not final. The relationship we have be with, with 
with God lasts far beyond his wrath. He loves us too much to allow us to walk down the wrong roads without trying to turn our hearts back to him. That's why Israel and Judah were taken in captivity. He was trying to get their attention, turn their hearts back to him, trying to wake them up. And God said it's the same thing for us today. When we start going down the wrong road, he still tries to pull us back to him. And his greatest joy is to seeing that lost sinner repent and come back and follow him again. To see that people work to see the people worship him in their actions, in their lives, in their attitudes, in their deeds, in spirit and in truth, day in and day out. That's what brings joy to the heart of God. And that was his design for the people of Israel was to reflect that joy to the world. And now he's given them a chance to leave that captivity, leave that judgment behind and fulfill the promise that God's made to them. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you for your word, for the promise you give us to be your light, Lord, that your salvation will last forever, God, beyond whatever ways we might try and mess that up or try and take control of it God your salvation is still there reaching out to each one of us Lord God thank you for that fact Lord help us to walk in a manner worthy of that calling God help us to live a life that reflects that to those around us Lord we do thank you for the work you do in our lives we love you Lord and it's in Jesus name we pray amen well as always thanks for joining me I'm so glad you did next week we're going to try and tackle chapters 52 and 53 so we can knock out a couple more there, uh, but until that time, remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.